everybody and welcome to the Business and Economics BRLSI group. It's, it's great to see so many of you here today on Zoom. This is our second live online uh, session uh, and our first interview and our conversation. The last time we had an, uh, a presentation, so this is a slightly different format. And it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce to you Professor uh, Brad Evans, who is the Professor of Politics, Language and International Studies at the University of Bath. He's also a political philosopher and uh, dealing in the area of violence and uh, also has just written a book on the quarantine files with 25 uh, experts around the coronavirus and, and uh, the situation we find ourselves. I, I, I likened Brad earlier to, to a star, a podcast star, because uh, he has done a podcast with uh, Russell Brand and uh, they've been downloaded uh, at least two million times. He's also done uh, some work with the comedian Jimmy Carr and he has written uh, some 17 books on, on various subjects. And uh, as I spoke to him this afternoon, he's actually got another two books on the way. So clearly one of the people who's doing the most during this particular pandemic. There's lots of things I have missed out in terms of uh, Brad's uh, pedigree, but please welcome Brad Evans. And maybe Brad, you can actually start with telling people a little bit more about yourself. Like everybody else, I start the day with a list of about 20 things I hope to achieve and then do about three of them so, and procrastinate about the rest of it, trying to deal with the, the reality of it. So, um, I guess a bit about me in terms of I am, um, as you know, I'm a professor who works in the field of political violence, although I, have, I do have a background in economics, as I was mentioning to you earlier. Um, I, I guess I make a start in terms of saying um, I don't think, even though I specialise in political violence, I don't think any of that can be divorced from economics. And I don't actually, I think outside of academic study, the world doesn't operate in those kind of individual silos. So when we talk about politics, we're always talking about economics and we're always talking about psychology and so on. So that's kind of my understanding of, you know, how we end up engage with public conversation. Um, my background is I grew up in the South Wales Valleys and then uh, ended up somehow in academia through a long number of detours. And, and that was it, I guess. There was no kind of grand plan to my life, but then, you know, but I find being an academia and academ an academic a remarkable privilege, and it remains a privilege. Excellent. Well, and we're delighted to have you here today, because I think uh, uh, this is quite a far-ranging and, and diverse uh, discussion we're going to have today uh, mm -hmm. regarding uh, the pandemic, uh, but also the unprecedented government intervention in the economy. Well, not just in the economy, actually in the state as a whole. I mean, you know, some people seem to suggest that uh, rural, UK, uh, rural Britannia has been nationalized wholesale uh, mm -hmm. since the outbreak of this, uh, this uh, uh, pandemic. So maybe we'll start with a much broader concept uh, from an economic point of view, and that is uh, the restriction of liberty and movement as part of the lockdown and the pandemic. And clearly uh, the, the government uh, rhetoric on this and, and maybe the, the flouting of this by individuals like Dominic Cummings. So maybe we can start there in terms of the restriction of our liberty and our movement. Hmm. Well, I think, um, let, let's deal with Dominic Cummings first actually, because I think we obviously we might as well get that out of the way. And in terms of, um, the restrictions around what, right? And I think, first of all, I think it is, we do need to recognize actually, um, whatever we think of Dominic Cummings, and I know a lot of people wanted him, have been waiting for him to fall and waiting for him to kind of slip up um, in one way or another. Um, some of the media coverage around him has actually been quite shameful. Whatever we think of him as a person, I think we have to recognize that he's still a father with a child and he doesn't deserve to have, you know, all this thing outside his house and making him a target in that way. Whatever we think of his politics, yeah. and I think it's quite a deceitful politics at times, what some of the things he's, he's been subjected to is wrong. And none of us would believe that he would willfully endanger his parents. So I think, you know, we need to kind of move a bit away from that demonization, which can go too far sometimes ethically. So I think that's the first point to make. Now, the second point is what he did was clearly wrong. And it was clearly long when the rest of the country has been asked, as you say, to engage in unprecedented actions, which go against the very fabric of what we understand our society to be. 
our society is based on the idea that we have the freedom of mobility, the freedom of movement, freedom. Now we've been asked to compromise and give that up at a particular moment by a government which requires a great deal of good faith. And I think what really has been upsetting for a lot of people is that very idea of good faith has been broken somehow by this. And it's as if there is kind of one rule for one and one rule for another. We don't mind if, you know, whatever happened to the idea, of course, we could say of leadership, which leads by example. But the question, of course, with Dominic Cummins is, he's not a leader. He's no. not. And I think that raises another diff different question. You know, if you think about, you know, the very idea of Brexit was thought on this idea of doing away with the unaccountable, unelected bureaucrats. And here we're having a very public discussion about an unaccountable, unelected bureaucrat who has clearly significant power at the heart of government. Yes. And I think so. So I think that, that is the Cummings issue, I think, which we need to kind of recognise that, which brings really us, you know, into clear, I guess, focus, how movement is so important to this debate, how movement actually is. And it's actually been the one thing, perhaps up to now, we haven't really focused on so much, apart from just demonising people for, you know, breaking the lockdown rules. And I think, you know, that there was, that there's a wonderful quote by, um, a French philosopher called Gilles Deleuze who once said that, you know, if people are being oppressed, it's not that their rights are being denied, but their movements are being restricted. Yeah. Now, I, I do believe there's, there's some validity in this. Now, we temporarily have been willing to give up all those rights or, you know, and recognize that actually under these conditions, perhaps that's temporarily important. Yeah. And this requires a massive investment from us to do this, a massive basis of trust, I guess, to do that. Yeah, and I think I, I suppose you know there's there's the different sides to uh, restrictions of of liberty and movement. Uh, mm -hmm. Clearly, uh, this has been done on the goodwill that uh, we're trying to protect others, not mm -hmm. just ourselves, but we want to protect others. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's commentators like uh, Martha Sperrier from Liberty's uh, Liberty, and uh, you know she's concerned about the extent of the legislation that has been passed by government in mm -hmm. terms of uh, potentially restricting uh, movement and liberty for much longer and much much further into the future than is intended just with the pandemic. What is your view on that? Well, that is an evident danger that we have to be alert to. And, and I do think, actually, it's quite an interesting moment, actually, if you think in terms of, um, if you observe the commentators, you have, especially in America as well, you know, the, the alt-right, we're all demanding, let's get back to work, this is our freedom, these are our rights. Yeah. But also people on the very radical left are also saying, actually, we need to be kind of careful here. Now, some people are kind of grouping those two together now and saying they're all alike. And that's preposterous because their politics is very different. But there is a danger where, you know, at what point do we say, right, OK, you know, we've been willing to accept these kind of measures because, as you say, it's not for us. right? It's not for, you know. We are not the vulnerable group, but I hope we are not, you know, I can speak for myself, hoping that I'm not the vulnerable group. I guess you not, don't ultimately know, but you kind of think, well, actually, in terms of the profile, the chances of myself being affected. So, of course, you're willing to accept this as yeah. an aspect of social responsibility. You know, it's almost like this, it's, all, it's, all, it's an altruistic move. It's an ethical move to say, well, actually, we will accept this. The danger will become if we recognise that this becomes the vehicle through which puritanical politics gets imposed yeah. upon... You will have to look at what's happening in China at the moment with the new security measures to clamp down on pro-democracy activists, yeah. which is using the pandemic in a very politicized way. And I think that's where people will start then to say, well, actually, we don't accept this because this is what we didn't agree to. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think the interesting thing is that it all seems, uh, not just in the UK, it seems to be globally, it seems to be sort of a very sort of uh, separatist type of attitude to deal with certain parts as if other parts weren't correlated, you know, whether it's the social side or the medical side, the scientific side, the economic side, they, they, they don't seem to be uh, pulled together as a sort of whole thing. Instead, we seem to be sort of, maybe come on to the second question that I had for you, is the terminology and the rhetoric and the, the language that is being used around the pandemic, you know, is if we, it seems to be more or less saying, so, okay, we've had restrictions of our movement, our liberty, and this last time this probably happened was during the war years, uh, you know, mm -hmm. nearly a century ago. Um, but the language also seems to be all about, sort of, you know, images of war. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that narrative actually happened very quickly, and it actually happens very quickly in China, where China basically says, you know, we have the, 
um, that the virus is an enemy. And then it becomes very politicized where they, they held a day of silence for the martyrs, what they called them, which were the medical people who died. Yeah. And that narrative was very quickly picked up by Donald Trump, also picked up by Boris Johnson. But every leader across the world has used this war metaphor and this war narrative. Now, on the one hand, you can say, well, that in itself should get alarm bells ringing because the war narrative very much lends itself to what we'd call exceptional security measures. So there would be this kind of politics of exception where they can basically say, well, we need to introduce this legislation because we're in a time of war. Right? Also, we know when you invoke a war narrative, it always benefits incumbent leaders yeah. because they can present themselves as being, as Trump said, you know, he's a wartime president. But the war narrative also then can lead to, you know, the normalization, militarization, Oops, I think you've. Uh, narrative. Oh, you're back again. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it's it's very dangerous to to invoke those kinds of war metaphors and war narratives precisely for what they mean for politics. And I think you know, and I understand they're quite seductive, but I think it's also worth looking at it from the other side as well, and that's from the perspective of the victim. I was recently ch chatting to a friend of mine who um, survived cancer, and she was saying to me that. The, the war metaphor was also used frequently for cancer patients. They were saying, you know, you're fighting this virus and it's an enemy. And she was saying that was just completely unhelpful for her. You no, know, because you feel like as if you're not good character, if you, you know, so what if you don't defeat it, you're not fighting hard enough or you're, you know, a virus is not an enemy, it's a virus. It's a yes. disease. And I think if we collapse it into this enemy, the problem is when you have an enemy, you need to embody it. So then we look for scapegoats. Yeah. And then the scapegoat becomes the Chinese or it becomes somebody else who could be the carriers. And I think that's a real dangerous racial politics to go down. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, maybe maybe after the sort of in initial two uh, introductory questions, we can sort of veer now a little bit more into the sort of economic side of things. Mm -hmm. Because clearly, uh, you know, the, the most of the productive and service industries uh, around the world, but also in the UK, have effectively been shut down. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the impact of that has been significant. I mean, you know, we've, we've got a forecast here of uh, a GDP reducing by 14%, which, which is, you know, it's probably three and a half times that it did on, after the 2008 uh, global financial crisis. So, I mean, this is, this is uh, very significant stuff. And, and we really don't know how this is going to play out. So I just wonder whether you've got any view in terms of uh, the impact that will have in terms of effectively shutting down large swathes of the economy. Mm -hmm. I, well, first of all, I want to go back to your first point about, um, you know, the, this idea that this is an unprecedented intervention by the state. Um, Actually, it's not that unprecedented because we did intervene actually in a larger scale in the financial crisis in 2008. But maybe we can come back on to discuss that a bit later when we talk about the furloughing. But actually, state intervention of a massive scale has happened before historically, especially when it's come to, say, the banking industry. So I think yeah, there's, yeah. you know, so actually the intervention itself is actually not that unprecedented in terms of the numbers. Now, what is unprecedented, I think, is the changing temporal nature of the economy as you say the slowing things yeah. down to the point of almost coming to a standstill yeah. now i think in in that sense perhaps you know we know for instance after the great depression in the early 1920s we had to effectively invent economics or reinvent economics because yeah. we didn't have the you know and let give rise to the whole keynesianism and this idea of, you know so they need to reinvent the discipline of economics to try to make sense of those conditions Maybe we are in that moment now where we need to say, well, what is it about our economies where we simply are incapable of slowing things down? Hmm. That, you know, we're so dependent on this speeding up of everything, speeding up production, continuous growth, continuous, you know, increasing the profitability of everything. And this type of idea of economic model, perhaps the lesson from this, this is actually let's learn to be more sustainable. If we have a crisis like this, then perhaps it is okay to slow things down for a yes. while. Well, I, suppose, I suppose, I mean, you know, slowing down uh, the economy uh, is obviously predicated on having different uh, critical success measures. Mm -hmm. And if, if the only game in town is GDP, mm -hmm. and which everybody's fixating about and saying, you know, this is going to be the worst depression since the Great Depression, mm -hmm. then do you feel that... Uh, 
the country or even the, the world is ready for actually looking at economics and, and measures of success very differently? Well, if you look across the world today in terms of, you know, I think one of the problems we have today actually is we, we, we're having in this moment where there's an unprecedented crisis. And I think that corresponds actually with a moment where I, I can't remember historically such distrust in the political leadership across the world. Right. And where, you know, you kind of think, well, where is leadership coming from? Now, I've, you know, found actually over the last couple of years in particular, especially in response to, for instance, terrorist attacks and so on, one of the leaders to me who's really stood out is Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, the way she's responded to crisis. And she's actually made the call very recently about we need to move away from GDP. We need to move away from these very crude assessments of economic growth. We do need to rethink. Now, of course, we know what you're saying. You know, if things stay as they are, the yeah. chances are we are going to end, enter into a period of serious economic downturn. How we respond to that is not certain. We can respond to it in a very positive way. It's how we choose to respond to it will be, the, I guess, the litmus test for us. Yeah, and, and I think you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, the intervention isn't unprecedented because of what happened after the global financial crisis 2007-2008, mm -hmm. uh, where the governments obviously bailed out uh, the financial sector, by mm -hmm. and large, and, and maybe even the automotive industry this one is sort of slightly different in terms of this seems to be going back to the people actually helping the people mm -hmm. uh, rather than the institutions although you know with large parts of the economy being closed it seems to be as if different countries have different strategies so for example uh, yesterday on the news was uh, the german government taking a 20 percent stake in lufthansa mm -hmm. and you know nine billion deal so we seem to be going back to to a strategy which is much more akin to what happened in the 2007-8 crisis rather than just people. And I think maybe uh, that needs to be thought about as we come out of furloughing and, and supporting people's income in terms of uh, how is that going to work with organizations and companies who mm -hmm. need to find their feet again. Well, I think, you know, when we look back on this, I think one of the best ways of diagnosing the political system will be to look at what was actually bailed out. Yeah. What, what, who was actually being bailed out? What emphasis was put on them? And I don't just mean in this kind of first kind of, you know, six months. In yeah. the longer term, how do we kind of, you know, and you kind of think, you know, in terms of we've seen some of the calls for bailouts, for instance, you know, from the likes of Richard Branson, you know, which has kind of come across a bit rich when he told, you know, said British Airways shouldn't be bailed out, right? And then, you know, yeah. commanding, you know, so I think there's been, but then, Virgin employs a lot of people, so it's not the so Virgin is not Richard Branson. It's it's people's livelihoods and people's jobs, and you know. And I think we have to be kind of mindful of that. But I think, I think the real ethical test for a government in terms of how we reassess them in five years' time will be to look at how they dealt with the bailout of people yeah. and livelihoods. And as you say, it's not just the big corporations because the difference with this to the financial crisis. You know, the thing about the, the financial crisis of the bailouts of the banks, we were kind of bailing out people who were relatively okay. What we're dealing with now, and I know we, we've talked about, you know, in, in terms of prior to this, this session going live, is people whose livelihoods are completely fragile. Yeah. Who, the idea of stopping, you know, um, the local community when I walk around you, you know, if you're walking around a ghost town and you know all the local restaurants, the local bars, they're going to be so precarious at the minute, and they, but they always already were precarious. So how do we understand that kind of the small traders and you know who've be, again been exposed and been so vulnerable through this? Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, this is a good time to go to sort of uh, uh, our next sort of area, which is all about uh, supporting individuals and businesses throughout this uh, pandemic. And and what I think what is an unprecedented uh, uh, scenario where the government now effectively employs one in every three and a half people in this country mm -hmm. uh, by actually paying uh, their wages up to 80 percent of up to 2500 pounds i mean that, you know that i don't think that has ever happened and uh, clearly that's uh, that's a much welcome initiative by the government in terms of the low paid the people who haven't actually got uh, this kind of resources mm -hmm. um and uh, you know it's been extended till the end of october which which is which again is, is great news for individuals um, how sustainable is that? I mean, the government is racking up £20 billion uh, pounds so far. The whole thing is probably going to cost between 80 to £100 billion. Pounds. Mm 
Mm -hmm. how, long, how do you, do you think this can actually be uh, continued? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the thing is, if we look in terms of global wealth distribution, it's not as if the money is not in the system. Right? It's not, you know, it's how we choose to allocate money and allocate wealth. Now, you know, it raises a question first of all, to say, what does it mean about a society where we have a pandemic and or we have a crisis of this nature and the vast majority of people appear so vulnerable to it? so precarious you know we talk about the longer term implications we have no idea what the mental health implications of this are going to be of this economic problem are going to be going forward it's not as if there is not the wealth in the system to deal with a crisis like this but it's how that wealth is redistributed now we for instance you look at instance, you know, could we sustain this going forward well yes you know there's enough money being invested into trident right, to keep this going quite considerably actually right so you know there, there is that kind of, you know, the allocation of wealth or, you know, let's start thinking of taxing the people like Amazon, right? Or let's start taxing, the, you know, all these big companies who have made billions and billions through this crisis. So, you know, not everybody's losing in this game. And I think it's how we kind of deal with that. You know, it's not like that this is inevitable economically. But, but do, you, do, you think, do you think the mindset, the global mindset, or at least the national mindset is right for that kind of thinking about the redistribution of wealth? No, clearly not. And I think that's the problem. You know, I think once this pandemic started, there was a particular moment, perhaps a very small window of opportunity, where we could have actually, you, talk, you know, talked about, you know, the need to bring together like the medics and the economists and the sociologists. One thing this virus has shown to us, actually, is the borders are irrelevant. Right. We need to recognize that we live in a very fragile, globally interconnected system, what we might call the biosphere. We, we, we're all part of this world together, this system together. We're all vulnerable to each other's shocks. There was a very brief moment where we could have said, actually, let's really think globally on this. Mm. Let's set aside all this kind of nationalism, all this, you know, this impetus around we have to maintain economic you know, competition as usual and actually take a different direction in the political. But that was lost very quickly, sadly. And that seems to be the case that often happens after crisis. In the times of great crisis, we often have the very leaders we don't deserve. Yeah, but what is interesting, isn't it? Because uh, there seems to be, there seems to be more uh, unison mm -hmm. after the global financial crisis, you know, in terms of actually how to deal with the, the debt, the financial debt that's built up and, and, and having a, a relatively unified position. Whereas, it's not clear three months into, into, you know, into the pandemic in the UK, probably six months globally, that actually there is this coherent, collaborative uh, unison in terms of you know, how do we deal with things differently from a socio perspective, economic perspective, uh, even a political perspective. You know, we're looking at, at everybody doing their own thing mm -hmm. uh, rather than actually saying, how do we deal with the situation holistically? Well, I think that raises a really interesting question. You know, why is it that is such unison globally, politically, yeah. when the banking sector is in crisis, but when people are in crisis, there's such division? And I think that in itself perhaps is very revealing, tells us perhaps everything we need to know about the distribution of global power. So I think that's something, again, which, you know, even in the very ask, the fact that we need to ask that question, there's something in the answer already given to us, I think. Yeah, and I, I mean, you know, uh, and I suppose uh, refocusing uh, activities, as you said, you know, you, you mentioned Trident, but I think, you know, if we're looking at a bill for the, the sort of support of workers and, and businesses in terms of uh, furloughing, uh, then, you know, we're looking, we're looking at big sums, 200 billion, you know, mm -hmm. talking about a sort of trade def a deficit, a budget deficit of about 330 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, as you say, there may be enough money in the system, but it would need to have wholesale redistribution across the, the economic area. Yeah, it, it, it demands a, a, you know, a real significant rethink. But I think that's where then I'm always really troubled by people who say, you know, let's get back to normal. You know, an event of this nature, we shouldn't go back to normal. You know, we should really think, well, actually, this has had such a profound impact on so many aspects of societies. Yeah. If this doesn't force a fundamental rethink in the way we order our societies, the values that we attribute in our societies, then perhaps nothing will, right? And I think that's part of the issue, then, too.
Yeah, so, th so this brings me on to, to another sort of question. You know, if, if, if we are saying, look, this is, this is a sort of once in a generation uh, fundamental issue that really could be the impetus uh, uh, for us to actually think about things slightly differently. Uh, in the sh very short term, you know, if furloughing comes to an end, for example, in October, and uh, from August, employers are asked to contribute tw a quarter of the costs of furloughing, which they haven't done so far. And Rishi Sunak is already saying that actually within that cohort of seven and a half million uh, furloughed workers and potentially even five million self-employed people in the UK, a lot of these are effectively de facto already unemployed. Mm -hmm. yeah. How does that play to to the need of actually doing things differently? I mean, there seems to be uh, already a business ethos which says, look, we, we are not going to pick up our business uh, back to where we were anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the people we've been employing and the government has been paying, as soon as the government isn't paying the full amount of money and we don't have a smooth transition to, to full production, people will be laid off and unemployment will rise. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a realistic scenario. Well, I, you know, the, the point that I think you, you emphasize quite well is that, um, you know, what is the short term for this? Well, the, the answer is there's none, right? But, you know, this, we know we're in this for the long haul until there's a vaccine found, you know, which by most medical estimates is still not going to happen for another 12 months, right? Realistically. No. If we want to do things properly and with ethical consideration and actually ensure that, you know, that this, this actually works properly. So even if we're looking at a 12 month period, you know, we have to accept that there's going to be a much longer process that's underway. Now, the question then becomes, you know, what even does an economy look like after this? You know, one of the things we, we know, you'll know studying economics, economic theories are great at predicting, at telling you the history, but they're not so good on the future in terms of predicting how things are going to turn out. And the, the, one of the things is we, we don't, the things we don't know about, especially we, we have no idea how consumers are going to respond after this. Yeah. You know, some might go out and say, well, actually, I can't wait to go to a restaurant and, you know, go to a bar and, you know, drink myself stupid amongst a hundred people. Right? But maybe that would happen. But other people might be much more reticent thinking, actually, I don't know if I'm gonna have a job in a year's time, you know? So maybe I need to really save my money. Maybe, I, you know, and, and I think there's good, we have no idea how that's going to work. And I think what it's going to mean, I think economically is we need to recognize that there's going to need to be a much stronger aspect of social security for people. And a much stronger aspect, unless that's there, then the people who are furloughed now are just basically an unemployed army in the waiting. And yeah. I think that's, that's, that could be very devastating for our societies. And, and, and how do you think, I mean, obviously this is, this is, the, this is sort of the, the abyss that might be facing uh, various people uh, in the country, you know. Uh, and therefore, how do you think that can be bridged, given, <laughs> given that businesses uh, don't feel that they're going to go back to full capacity, you know, overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, given that people in general are feeling not uh, as if they're going to be going straight back to their spending habits of, of, of previous months prior to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that? To have a transition where not everybody has wholesale unemployment, not just in the UK, but, you know, globally. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I know Spain have been talking about this idea already of like a universal basic wage, right? which in itself seems an important ethical move. And I think, you know, we need to really have a serious and urgent rethink about what does social security mean in a sense, not what everybody just gets paid money to be unemployed, yeah. but how we can really engage with this in a real meaningful way. Now, it would be wonderful for every government in the world to kind of say, okay, you know, do you know what? We've got this. Right? Yeah. We will do what it takes to ensure that actually we're not in a situation where the divide between the very wealthy and the very poor increases exponentially. Yeah. Because we know actually this myth about we're all in this together. We know actually the areas which are already deprived are going to suffer much worse yeah. as a result of this these economic conditions. So I think, you know, we do need to recognize that it's not just about the short term response, but the real economic litmus test politically is how we deal with this in the longer term. And that requires the government to say, hey, you know what, we've got this, right? 
Absolutely. No, but <clears throat> so in the short term, though, I mean, you know, because uh, we, you know, indicated earlier, people are already talking about a recession because we've had mm -hmm. two consecutive quarters of, of negative growth. Um, mm -hmm. But how likely is it that is it actually we are facing a global depression? Mm -hmm. In, in the short term, at least, of the next year or two, uh, rather than uh, a belief that we can spring back from this, because I think some of the, the sort of projections seem to suggest that, you know, we take a big dive in 2020 uh, and uh, we'll bounce back in 2021. I mean, Well, if we follow the economic statistics, it says we're already into this recession now, and this recession is going to hit. And, and that the problem seems to be that we are applying the same old economic thinking which seems to inexorably be leading us to a recession because yeah. it's kind of similar Actually, we need to, you know, just return back to the old economic model. But we know that old economic model in itself was kind of premised on shocks and risk and vulnerability and fragility and a big divide between the global wealth, between the wealthy and the, you know, people who have nothing. So I think if we apply that old economic model to this current environment, then we are certainly going to go into a big recession. And perhaps the problem also becomes, and we're seeing this already at the moment with, you know, um, I was reading a, a tweet which Stephen Fry put out earlier about British Airways and how British Airways are now using this crisis as a foil to introduce quite draconian neoliberal economic measures. Yeah. So there is already then this kind of moment where we, you know, we have to be very mindful now that, corporations themselves and businesses are not using this actually as an op opportunity to really accelerate change yeah. which they already wanted to do but can now lay off people because it's you know they can bypass unions and so on but it seems it seems to be as if uh, you know current economics is still being treated as if it was a complicated system mm -hmm. rather than a complex entity mm -hmm. and uh, you know maybe maybe we maybe do you have any views in terms of how we can think more in terms of an interconnected biosphere, I think, as you called it earlier, rather than, rather than this sort of complicated system or machine? To me, it has to begin with ethics. And, you know, again, one of the things we were talking about earlier, I, I recently gave an interview with um, Gareth Hohen, who is the Director of Humanitarian Affairs for Save the Children. Now, Gareth was one of the lead people who was organising the whole Ebola crisis in Africa. And, yeah. and you know obviously save the children are part of a development organization and and he was saying in this interview i was giving with him he said you know what's really surprised him is this feels like humanitarianism coming home right we we now all of us come into terms with the idea of food insecurity health insecurity waiting in queues you know albeit we don't have the war although we have the war metaphors right um and he was saying you know and when we think about it in terms of the so-called global south we always say, well, this surely demands better ethics amongst people. We have to have a better ethical relationship before we can build a new economy, yeah. before we can build a more just society. So for me, unless we have a better ethical conversation amongst people, the economics is not going to lead that. You no. know, we need to have that serious, you know, what does it mean to say that nobody should live in chronic poverty, whatever the condition, whether it's a pandemic or not? You know, how do we make sure we have the correct social systems in place where nobody has to feel food insecurity or health insecurity? And I think that those are the real questions we should be asking because they should be very stark for all of us right now. No, absolutely. And I, I suppose, you know, if, if you're looking at the, the trajectory of, of where we're heading, uh, you know, in terms of economically and potentially socially, there will be, there will be, st there already are, and there will be more uh, social strains, you know, in terms of either the, the restrictions or the lifting of restrictions or the impending increase in unemployment. So maybe, maybe you can just expand on your previous sort of answer and say, well, how do we do things differently or how is our ethical compass going to be slightly different in terms of actually uh, weathering this storm mm -hmm. uh, collectively rather than sort of us, the storm fracturing society? For me, it's not about reinventing anything. One of the things which has been quite remarkable, actually, if we get it beyond the kind of grand politics, is how remarkably humanist everyday people's response has been to this, you know, looking out for the elderly, you know, bringing even the subtle everyday gestures, the, the recognition now, wait a minute, actually, we need doctors and nurses in our society. Actually, you know, virologists are actually very, pretty useful to us, right? You know, this idea of the, you know, so I think when I talk about ethics, what we need actually is 
perhaps you know what we might call a trans valuation, but a, maybe a re-evaluation of yeah. things. But it's not about re it's not about inventing anything. You know, people have shown at the level of everyday compassion that that ethics is already there. It, you know, we have this shared understanding for people. Not everybody is all about, you know, I'm going to win and you're going to lose, right? And, no. you know, this idea of, you know, economics is just competition and survival of the fittest, you know, this has been the way our economic systems have been built, but they're not inevitable. And I think at the level of people, that humanism's there. It's all, we can only hope that humanism could translate into an ethical, political, economic alternative. Yes, and, uh, and obviously, you know, but I, I suppose... To what extent have we seen the best and worst of humanity throughout this crisis? Completely, you know. The best is every day the way in which we see medical workers going about their work, the way in which people have now really recognised and appreciated them, the way in which people have actually really recognised the importance of immigrants to this society, the way in which they've recognised the importance of precarious workers, the people you never noticed before, the person who's delivering your food, the person who is, you know, stacking the shelves in supermarkets. All these people become really important all of a sudden to us. The worst we've seen, Donald Trump, right? And that's, you know, it can't get much worse than that. Right, surely. Okay. And now in, in, in terms of a recalibration of value then, I mean, that's, that's also another interesting uh, perspective because clearly, as you described, uh, uh, frontline workers are seen as heroes. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. we, we go out every Thursday at eight o'clock, we, we show our appreciation, etc. Uh, do you think, do you think this is going to be an opportunity and is it likely that we're going to recalibrate uh, value to society, not just economic value, Mm -hmm. uh, now in different in different groups of employment for example or do you think or do you is your sense that after the pandemic it's a business as usual and we go back and pat people on the back for having done a good job and mm -hmm. back in the same scenario in terms of uh, income inequalities etc mm -hmm. well you hope the memory of this pandemic will last and um and you know but the problem is with our societies and especially in the age of social media you know two days later things are very quickly forgotten um, I would hope that that values still exist. Right. You would hope that there's something that can be built upon. You know, for me, of course, it, you know, th this would stay, right? These ideas will stay. And I think for a lot of people, they will reassess how they see their neighbours. They will reassess how they recognise the importance of healthcare workers, how they, the government wants to get things back to normal very quickly. And right. or certain people in society and I think that's dangerous. That's where the danger lies, because what they're saying is actually, let's get back to how things were prior to the pandemic. In other words, there's no real re-evaluation of what's gone. And I think, you know, so that to me is, which is why we always need to be suspicious of anybody who says, let's get back to normal. No, we need to get back to better. And I think that's where we, you know, where we can think about something different. Well, and I think, you know, getting back to normal is, is going to be a relative sort of term, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. Uh, it will be interesting to see what happens when, uh, you know, parents are going to supposedly send their kids back to school over the next week or so, uh, mm -hmm. whether, whether non-essential shops will all open on, on the 15th of June and things like that. So, um, but you, uh, it's interesting because you seem to have a, a sort of internal belief that actually society can move forward from this in a, in a positive way, not just having dealt with the pandemic, but actually having come to grips with some of the underlying issues the pandemic has given rise to in terms of social interactions, in terms of how we uh, look at the economy as a whole, how businesses treat employees, how businesses define their success, etc. So you seem to have an implicit belief that there's somewhere we can go that's in the better direction. Well, you know, without becoming too philosophical, I think, you know, it's, I like to think of like a pandemic like an event. It's a fundamental rupture in our system. Yeah. Like, you know, 9-11 was an event. We have these major events in history, which, whether we like it or not, do steer history in a particular direction. There's, there's, not, there's no, by no means certain where that direction goes, but it, can, you know, it does force a rupture. Yeah. Things are not going to, back, go, going to go back to normal. That's clear, right? So there is no normal to go back to. Things are going to change. It could be for the better or it could be for the worse. Now, we know from history, you know, every major pandemic has really forced a massive shift in history. It was really forced, you know, the Black Death gave rise to modernity, effectively, it gave rise to the need for the census, the modern state. So if we look at the history of the modern state, it emerges out of the Black Death. You know, this 
pandemic is going to have a big impact on our societies. It's how we take charge of that, I think, and how we steer in a more human direction, I think will be the, the, the challenge for us. Well, it'll be interesting to see whether it will lead to the cessation of the nation state. Mm -hmm. In a globally interconnected and uh, interacted, uh, interacting world. We'll oh, wouldn't see. that be a wonderful thing? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe on that positive note, we'll leave it. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Brad, for, for a riveting interview. I think, you know, if everybody now wants to go uh, off mute and you can have your cameras on and we go to the Q&A session. Okay, we still got quite a few people on mute. So I'll wait for those to come up and please put your, your screen on. Yes, Ridian, I can see you. Thank you. Uh, okay. My, my question is... Oh, one second, William. We, we, I'm just waiting for people to unmute and. Okay. Uh, the and the I think we are we're getting there. We've got, we've got another five or six people. Five or six come on. We're getting there. And if if it all crashes now, then. Uh, we'll have to, um, okay. Well, listen. I think most of our time. Coming. Maybe it's a good time now to actually thank Brad for all his efforts today in the interview in the usual way. There you go. Well done, Brad. I think thank you very much for a very interesting conversation. Um, if, if people if people could be on mute if they don't have a question, that would be helpful because I'm, I'm hearing lots of different noises in different households and I'm sure you don't want me to hear them necessarily. So if, if you want to be, if you don't have a question, go on mute. If you do have a question, please raise your hand in a normal way and then I shall pass you on to Brad. First one, Ridian wants to have a question. Ridian, your question. Uh, Professor Evans, uh, I uh, thought the talk was very good and I really enjoyed your economic analysis, but I'm interested with your other field of violence, um, are you surprised there haven't been food riots in America? The one thing America has, outside of the pandemic, had to deal with is chronic food insecurity anyway. Right? So many people in America live with chronic in food insecurity. Um, and I was reading actually a recent statistic prior to the pandemic, there was more chronic starvation amongst children in New York State than what it is in Calcutta, which is a remarkable statistic. So I think in America, um, America at the moment for me is very troubling for so many reasons, so many racial reasons, so many political reasons, and it feels like it's almost like a powder keg waiting to really explode. And a powder keg waiting to explode in a society which is so armed to me, I have a lot of friends in America and I'm very worried for them at the minute because I do think that the, it won't take a lot for the American society to tip. Because one thing this pandemic has shown for all of us actually is how fragile our societies really are. And I do think that America is kind of on a knife edge. And I think, would we expect food riots? Well, I don't think any society is above a food riot. I think actually, you know, should things have got more, you know, fraught here, it's not beyond us to have food riots here. And, and I think one of the issues um, about, you know, one of the things this invisible virus has showed us is what's also very invisible in our societies. And part of that is the food chain. We have no idea where our food comes from. And, and I think that, again, is where a lack of knowledge and security People are not going to write if they feel security that there's food going to be on the table. But the problem that we don't know, and I think, but in America in particular, I'm, I'm thankful there hasn't been any food riots. But I do think the possibility for America in particular to accelerate very badly, very quickly is very real. And I think that's something we have to be very alert to. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good. We've got Trevor. Trevor, you've got another question. Uh, yes, uh, can I just make a small statement as well? First of all, everyone's a question. Uh, you talked about GDP uh, earlier. I think GDP as a measure of uh, economic change has been on the way out for some time. And I just hope that this uh, crisis will 
it accelerate that because it's not really a measure of anything. We've recognized that for a long time, especially mm. as we try to compare it. But my question is this, uh, for the Conservatives to, Conservative Party to react in this, what can only be called a very socialistic way, must have many traditional Conservatives turning in their graves or at least been wondering what on earth is happening. My question is, what do you think will be the medium long term effect on British politics of this? Mm -hmm. Do you think there will be effects and will it, so will it last? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, going back to first of all the point around um, Conservatives turning in their grave, I can only imagine how Margaret Thatcher would have felt when Boris Johnson said there is such a thing as society. <laughs> so I think there's, there's something in this moment in itself, but you can imagine, you can almost imagine, you know, you hear the bones rattling, right? <laughs> there's something that, that, you know, but I, of course there is, we can look at it on the face level and say, well, of course, there's, there's almost like this conservative socialism which has taken over. The litmus test of that will be how it plays out in the long run not in the short run, because this could just be another imposition of debt upon the shoulders of people who are never going to be able to pay it back. So mm -hmm. it could just be a debt redistribution rather than socialism in, a, in that kind of sense. So um, now, do I think that the Conservatives will go back to a very swift austerity? I don't think so, because I don't think Boris Johnson himself necessarily believed austerity was a good thing anyway. How they finance this in the longer term, I don't know. You'd hope there'd be a much better debt management with this. Um, but somebody's going to pay, and I still think the people who are going to pay ultimately are the ones who can least afford to pay it. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, Tony, you you want you raise your hand. You that's great, Tony. You. Yes, uh, I'm I'm interested in uh, Professor Professor Evans's uh, uh, lecture. It's uh, mostly illuminating. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it has given us an extraordinary opportunity. This pandemic where we were in an economic river of activity and it's given us a chance to get out on the bank and have another look at it and see where we're going. Mm -hmm. What I feel is uh, sad is that the economic impact is going to be on those who are least able to uh, cope with it, the small businesses. Obviously, are we going to see our towns with half the businesses closed? Mm -hmm. And the pressure that we've seen in the past for um, buying things as cheaply as possible by exporting and manufacturing and buying in as cheap as possible. has meant that uh, we've had to look for different uh, economic involvement of the population. But that has come at a cost, you know, uh, contract, uh, uh, zero contract hours. And we've had the average wage, as I understand it, no higher uh, than what it was before the 2008-9 banking crisis. Mm -hmm. So what my question is, where will the ethics go when any party has the power to come in and say, look, we need to reconcentrate our economy much more locally, mm -hmm. put the cost up of imports, so that people are, uh, in a way, put off from buying things that are cheap, that exp export jobs. Mm -hmm. Do we need to relook at the whole economic situation, as you explained? But is there a political will there to take to take that through from any of the political groups? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I I don't think you know. I think there's a danger if we kind of say, well, local localism becomes nationalism. So we say we encourage people to buy local, but then it becomes a kind of a nationalistic kind of narrative because that's something which we was already there with Brexit, right? So I, I agree with you in that sense. I think I think one of the things in terms of as, as ethical consumers going forward, we could say, well, the first thing we have to do is do whatever we can to support local businesses, right? Support whatever we can to kind of help the people who are the most vulnerable in, in that moment. But we also need to recognize that there are globally precarious people around the world. I think your point is absolutely right in terms of what seems to be emerging from this, is the real winners are the ones who have been able to weather the storm, the ones who, and what that could lead to, the, the real tragedy this could lead to is a much greater division in, in every single sector of societies towards the big elite corporations. Mm 
whether we talk about food distribution or even if we talk about football, right? How many football clubs are now going to go bankrupt, but all these super elite clubs will still survive? Yeah. And actually, they, they will profit even more in the future. And I think we have to, you know, so the ethics to me has to come in this sense of kind of saying, okay, first of all, we need to protect the local producers, the local, you know, very vulnerable organizations which can't sustain and you know support themselves and that should require an ethical implication but also with an eye to actually let's think more globally about this as well so rather than just retreating back into nationalistic silos and, and in a way it actually that you know most of these organizations which have really benefited are truly global beyond the power of the nation state beyond the power of you know and i think how we reassess that i think has to be the way forward thank you very much Okay, uh, Michael, you have a question. You're on mute at the moment. Michael, you're on mute. That's it. I've unmuted myself. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's fine. Right. Uh, well, I'd like to say how um, much I've enjoyed this talk and uh, the uh, it was very thought provoking, and I think it works very well on this medium. But my question is um, about the uh, idea that the, the, the size of the economy the extent of the cape so to speak if we can talk wealth in terms of a cape that it's still there and remains the same it seems to me that uh, the problem is that it's not still the same it will have been considerably shrunk through this lockdown uh whatever the merits of the lockdown but the, the, the economic effect is that we will have a much smaller cape um because first of all the loss of output itself but also uh, the loss of infrastructure um which creates that cake to a significant extent also the huge debts that have been built up which is really minus cake isn't it mm -hmm. so these questions of how we uh think about redistrib redistribution uh, particularly between very rich and very poor uh the problem in the short to medium term is that the actual cake that we've got to distribute is going to be significantly smaller it's not the same i didn't quite understand that point about how it's how it has remained the same. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree with you. I, I don't. Um, well, I, I think the the cake as we've had it is is de definitely shrinking. But I think there's it doesn't mean to say that there's not the money in the system to still make sure that nobody has to feel so precarious through this. And I think part of that, in terms of you know. Um, we spend globally $300 trillion every year on military investment. So we have the money in the global system to ensure that, you know, that if you work out $300 trillion, that's somewhere close to $30,000 per person who's alive working on that planet every single year in investment. So it's not as if there is not the money in the global system, or even in the national system, it will require a redistribution. Now, it will, of course, require for many of us perhaps a change in lifestyles, a change in a lifestyle where we say, well, actually, maybe we need to think a bit more sustainably. But what I do think that it, you know, this requires a political will, because I don't buy the idea that there's simply not enough money within the system to help the people who are the truly vulnerable and precarious in this situation. So I think that, you know, but it will require a major political impetus. And I sadly don't think that that impetus is there. So I think that's where we're at. Okay. Anybody else for anything more? Mark, are you busy? Okay, Mark. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Mark. Um, thank you for a talk. It was very um, interesting. A, a question. I'm um, going back to your the new normal, and I applaud your ideological um, positivism and uh, hope that the future holds something more than what we've had in the past. However my pragmatism tells me that people are naturally selfish avaricious and out for themselves and, and 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 if they have to tread on people on the way up they'll tread on people on the way up so i worry that we might start off with a new approach to societal organization but very quickly the chap next door starts doing rather better than you and you start thinking, crikey, I better pull my socks up and do something more exciting myself. And before we know it, we're back exactly in the same place where we were before. What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. 
I think I'm, this is the first time that anybody's ever called me positive. <laughs> I'm normally classed, told that I'm really bleak and negative. So I, um, I, I don't disagree that, with you that, um, you know, you try to be positive and you try to say, well, actually, that you think there's some kind of hope that we will come out of this better. But history tells us actually time and time again that the most reactionary voices often win after a crisis, right? So maybe it's part of my own kind of survival mental health condition to try to say, well, actually, maybe things won't be so bad. Um, I, I hold on to the idea that things could be better, but the systems we have in place now will work against that because the systems, I don't buy the idea that there's, um, there's an essence to human beings and human beings are naturally violent or human beings are naturally competitive. I think people are cultured into that way of thinking. People are cultured into that. Now, could we imagine a better system where people are more kind of empathetic? Well, you know, in this society, people are very empathetic to one another, but some people are not. The problem we have is it's often the people who are not are the ones who rise to the top. And I think that should be where our questions should be asked. Why is it this precisely the people who have the characteristics who many of us would say, well, actually, I wouldn't want to be that way. They're the ones who are the most successful. And maybe that's where we need to, you know, have a much more rigorous philosophical and political conversation about why are we putting on a pedestal the very types of people who exhibit characteristics which actually don't look particularly nice to us? Well, let's hope so. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I suppose it depends whether we have reached a tipping point, you know, in terms of uh, the global economic system, uh, whether it actually is fit for purpose in terms of what we've just encountering and continue to encounter for what mm -hmm. probably is going to be for the next uh, few years. This isn't going to be something that's going to go away over the next six months. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. I like uh, Brad's view on humanity. It's not neither inherently bad or good. It's, it's something that is... Uh, uh, societally driven, but uh, the jury's out. Uh, anyone else for other, other questions? Lee, you've got a question. Please go ahead. If I may, thank you very much, Andreas. Um, Professor Evans, thank you for an absolutely splendid, wide-ranging talk. Um, I'd particularly like to ask you about the comment that came up several times about the way we could reorganise or restructure society. And I'm thinking back to about two and a half thousand years ago in Athens when Plato um, decided that he would like to restructure society along the lines of his pure republic. Mm -hmm. Now, not going down that road, but nevertheless, looking at a way of optimising society, I wondered what your personal views were. If you were in that, you know, megalomaniac position to be able to restructure society, what sort of elements would you insert to, to ensure that it was sustainable and that you know, you're, you're, you're using human traits to bring out the best in us? And I wonder if you just had any personal thoughts on how you'd restructure our future. Well, I think first of all, the, um, we need to recognize that the ideologies of the 20th century have all been badly tainted, whether we talk about communism, you know, obviously fascism, but even liberalism has been very problematic for us. I think we need to maybe move beyond that kind of, those kind of narratives, because they've all been very badly failed human beings in so many different ways. Now, your point about Plato is actually really interesting and it's really important because Plato made the big mistake by kicking out the poets, right? That was Plato's fundamental error. If we want to reorder society, we need a better ethics. How do we do that? Well, precisely through the arts and humanities. We have to encourage a much richer understanding of what we might call poetics, right? You know, we need a much more poetic understanding of politics. And what I mean by that is a politics which is much more empathetic, which listens to the poets much more than it listens to Machiavelli. And I think, so that understanding, so, you know, if I was in, I wouldn't want to be a sovereign, right? Because that, that's, the, that's the last thing we need is another sovereign politics. It's how we can kind of bring together. I often say to my students, students ask me, you know, what, what is the best book of political theory ever written? And for me, it's always Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> Alice in Wonderland is just the most phenomenal book, right? This is for so many reasons. But to me, the most important thing is Lewis Carroll, what he embodies. He, he understands the importance of science. He's a mathematician. But he also understands the importance of imagination. 
He understands the importance of poetics. And we cannot have a society where one is better than the other. We need to have a new understanding of politics, which is technical and also poetic. And I think that would be, for me, where we could start a new conversation about what politics might look like. Thank you very much. Well, as a philosopher myself, I quite like Plato's idea of the philosopher king. You know, <laughs> he's got my vote. <laughs> anyway, anybody with more questions? We've probably got time for another couple of questions. Ridian, you've already had a question, haven't you? I have indeed, yeah. I've got another one. Okay, well, let's give, let's give other people a chance first. Okay. And I'll come back to you, Ridian. Okay. Anybody else in the meantime? The answer is no, Ridian, the floor is yours. Okay, well, I think one interesting thing about what we've seen is how much notice that the British public have taken of what is going on in other countries. In, when they saw that Italy was shutting down, when they saw that France was shutting down, they got ahead of the government. They started forcing, um, uh, public opinion forced the FA to cancel the premiership. Mm -hmm. It uh, stopped the, much to my chagrin, I had a ticket, uh, the Wales-Scotland rugby match. Mm -hmm. But it'll be interesting to see if this continues. Now, it brings me to a point that Andreas brought up when you said, what about transitions? Uh, what different things could we do? Now, first of all, the New Zealand Prime Minister, who you mentioned, uh, Professor Evans, has suggested a four-day week. Mm -hmm. And that is obviously seems to me a very good way of introducing a uh, transition. You said that the British government is going to probably withdraw the furlough. I think everybody is as surprised, actually, how solid they've been with it. Mm -hmm. And in Germany, they already have a system that helped a great deal in the 2008 financial um, mm -hmm. uh, crisis, um, which is like a furlough system. And will we start to look at other countries where they are doing things right? And I take another example, which is Portugal, mm -hmm. which Portugal has had um, a, a, a government that um, might have had Professor Evans as, as their advisor for the last 10 years. And they've had very, very good results. Will we start to take more notice of that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think your point is, is, is really interesting because the, you know, I was reading a piece recently which was saying about if we look at the way the British government has actually responded, it's actually borrowed or tried to borrow all the best bits from Europe, right? And actually, we haven't followed the United States of America, which many people might have expected us to do in, in that kind of short term thing. So in that sense, you know, this idea that we've left Europe is actually we're trying to take their better ideas. Um, so I think that's, you know, but how long it sustains, I, I don't know. I, um, I'm more skeptical about the long term commitment by the British government on this. I hope that they would sustain it. Um, but I do think, you know, I agree with you completely that we need to very quickly identify what is good practice. What is, what does a sustainable economic policy look, look like going forward? Because this thing is actually, you know, in many ways it feels like it's a, it's a lockdown and a slowdown, but so many things have been accelerated. Yeah. And so many things are actually moving at a very fast pace. And I think that is what we also need to be very alert to, is these kind of speeding up of processes as well, and the speeding up of problems which we thought were the realm of science fiction, and they're very real science factors just now. So how we kind of deal with them very quickly, but also learn the best practices, I think, is there's a new opportunity there to do that. So I agree with you. Yes, yeah, my, my, my view is similar to yours, Brad. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, is... Uh, just pinching each other's ideas and uh, then finding out in the long run that they may not have been the brightest idea is not, is not a recipe for success for me. Mm. I think it really does need global uh, connectivity and people actually working together to, to look at how this needs to be resolved, either medically, socially, economically and politically, mm -hmm. to make sure that there is a, a more sustainable infrastructure in place where people are actually supporting each other, uh, rather than everybody scrabbling for PPE, uh, having different approaches to the crisis, etc. It, it, it doesn't bode well for what you mentioned earlier, which is, is, a, is an inverted commas enemy uh, that doesn't have any borders. Yeah, and, and also there's, there's another important point because we're talking about the way in which this kind of virus is kind of migrating around the world, right? And one of the things perhaps it's 
also shown for us actually in terms of obviously you know it wasn't really a concern for us when it was in China, but the moment it hits mainland Europe, okay, now it's a concern, right? So there's something that's a problem there, maybe the way in which we and still understand distance and we still understand, you know, we believe that the ocean might still save us somehow. Um, but also I think what this crisis has also shown is as this, you know, this is spreading into India or, you know, particularly Latin America, for many people, the idea of a lockdown just isn't possible. It's, you know, it's a luxury sometimes that we have, you know, the, the idea that we can do this, right? That we can, you know, have this interconnectivity through the computers. We can lock down. That in itself is still a relative privilege that many people, particularly in Latin America, don't have. Yeah. And I think we need to re redress that globally as well. But that's not going to be resolved locally. So. Absolutely right. Okay, we've probably got uh, time for one more question. If somebody's got one final pressing question, then please go ahead. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up. Everybody happy? All right. Good. Okay, well, let's show our appreciation to uh, Professor Brad Evans once more for an excellent session. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Brad. And uh, just a quick question. Now I've got you on the, on, obviously on the screen. If you, do you want to put your hands up if this format works for you? Yeah? Well, it seems to be that most people seem to be engaged in this. So, in fact, more or less unanimously. So that's, that's great. Thank you for that. So we're going to continue uh, the business and economics program, hopefully with some more uh, live programs. We're working currently with Professor Boris Begovic from Belgrade University, who was going to come actually uh, and give a lecture on the cultural determinants of economics, i.e. how culture affects the way we look at business and the economy and how that differs from different cultures, which sounds really interesting. Now, obviously, Boris won't be able to come in person, uh, but he's either going to do a video lecture or even a live online lecture. And uh, I'll let you know over the next couple of weeks or so which one it is. Um, we've also got, uh, you know, we had, was it two weeks ago, we had uh, Dr. Uh, Nazir Salari giving a talk, live talk, on data systems and, and big business. And that will be available on video probably in about a week or two weeks' time for you to see it if you haven't already uh, been part of the, the live performance there. And uh, we'll keep on looking at other things as well. But uh, we certainly had the feedback from other people that live performances, so to speak, is the way forward. So uh, I'll keep you posted through the email list. Unfortunately, I can't hand out my email form for you to join the list, but obviously you must have my email address now because we've corresponded. So please be in touch. Uh, in the meantime, be safe, be healthy, and enjoy the nice weather. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.